Butterflies and moths are far less common now than they were 50 years ago, and you don't have to look hard to find out why. Since the 1940s, 97% of our wildflower meadows have been destroyed, along with much downland, ancient woodland and peat bogs. Many species are in serious decline as their countryside habitat has been lost to industrial and housing developments, intensive farming and roads. As a conservation association, the MTVCA in the autumn of 2014 are creating a butterfly and bee garden to the side and front of Burlington House. The front garden is on three different levels using steps. Over the years, many buddleia, campanula and roses have been planted. It was necessary to clear away the bindweed and prune the rose bushes and buddleia to see the outline of the various levels and then plan where the plants and seeds were going to go to ensure that each plant had sufficient light. Butterflies especially like sunny sheltered spots so this would have to be borne in mind during the development of the gardens. It is important to support butterflies at every stage of their life cycle. Adult butterflies lay eggs on the food plant of their caterpillar. So, to encourage butterflies to breed in our gardens, we will have to ensure we cater for their caterpillars also. The front and side gardens would eventually be joined together. Most of the work would have to be done though in the side garden first, where the pathways would have to be made, the ground scarred, a foundation laid for a small summer house, and wild flowers sown before winter in order that they would germinate by next spring. Many wildflower seeds need to be in the ground over winter for germination to take place. Seeds such as marigold, cornflower, red campion, nasturtium and poppies, to name a few, were obtained and mixed with yellow rattle which will suppress grass growth. We outlined the pathways with heavy cobbled stones found throughout the garden. We dug out the borders and then filled the inside of both sides with slate. The foundation was laid second week in September and the summer house delivered the same week. Hexagonal tiles and a hexagonal summer house brought to mind the natural form of honeycomb. Once we had the foundation laid, the work of constructing the summer house began. The floor and sides were put in place and it became apparent that the hardest part was going to be the roof. First of all, we needed to measure up the felt which would be put on top of bitumen to make it more waterproof. We laid it out in triangles and nailed it down. However, the construction of the roof was the trickiest part and we needed four people to hold the various segments whilst the roof was raised onto the walls. Eventually, we had it securely resting in place. We had been scouring the ground over the past couple of weekends and after a final scouring, we mixed all of our wildflower seeds with compost and sowed the side garden, tramping in the seeds as we went and then watered everything in. We commenced painting the second weekend in October and commenced building a hexagonal wall with the coping stones. It would also serve as a habitat for small mammals and insects. The glass was then put in and the same day we painted the wall and hexagonal tiles. The steps of the front garden were brushed down and the layout of the garden was obvious. We would be planting this with Hebe and more wildflower seeds and cuttings in the coming week. To finish off, we will make a small pergola between the two gardens, forming a natural corridor between the two. And then we'll trim the surrounding trees to allow light into the gardens. We can then place feeders, bird baths and insect houses in the garden and then wait for next spring and a blaze of colour with many visitors coming to feed and take up habitation in both gardens. Slate and coping stones were obtained from a free cycle website and paint and hexagonal tiles were sourced from friends and neighbours. So the garden cost is only in terms of the summer house. Seeds were also donated and all labour was free.